Thanks everyone for joining us. I'm Jordan Rudder, Director of Public Relations at American Bird Conservancy. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel afterward. And given that, all participants will have their videos off and microphones muted throughout. We'll be putting the links referenced in the chat, but in case you missed them or can't copy them down fast enough, please know that everything can be found in a follow-up email we'll send out to registrants and on our website. Again, this is being recorded and will be shared afterwards. Please submit any questions you have during the presentation using the Q&A box. We'll try to answer as many of those as we can during the Q&A portion at the end of the presentations. And our presenters will be able to answer some of those questions as well as we go through. We'll also have ABC staff members Gemma Radko and Erica Sanchez writing responses to you. But before I begin, I wanted to share some background on American Bird Conservancy, shortened to ABC, which was founded in 1994 with the mission of protecting wild birds across the Americas. We continue that work today following a conservation strategy outlined by the pyramids featured on the current slide. And our current work strives to help keep common birds common and prevent the rarest species from going extinct. There are over 350 species of migratory birds in the Western Hemisphere, and as a family, they fall into every level of the ABC pyramid. So today you'll hear from our panelists about this incredible group of birds and how they help bring people together. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our speakers. Tanya Romero is the program coordinator at the Audubon Center at Debs Park managing the native plant nursery, community engagement events, and the mapping migration, <laughs> I apologize, migraciones project. Her passion for birds led her to the Audubon Society, and Tanya was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. Growing in an urban environment, she believed that Los Angeles did not have any nature or wildlife and instead was a concrete jungle. She now knows nature can be found everywhere, even in urban settings. And she is passionate not only about birds, but providing nature connections to urban communities and social justice in the conservation field. Her career has consisted of field work ranging from point count, rate, point count surveys, bird banding, and habitat restoration to education, storytelling, and youth engagement. Sean Groff is ABC's Vice President of Operations for US and Canada. He came to ABC after serving 13 years as the executive director of the Ozaki Washington. There are a lot of words in here that I, <laughs> I need to practice more. The Ozaki Washington Land Trust in Wisconsin. He holds a master's of art in art history from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee and focused much of his research on historic preservation and city planning. In addition to directing the land trust preservation programs, he was responsible for all aspects of organizational development, including fund development, membership, education and outreach, land stewardship and conservation. We also are joined with Kimberly Kaufman, who is the executive director of Black Swamp Bird Observatory. She is an Ohio native whose lifelong, lifelong love of the outdoors grew into a passion for birds. She worked for many years as a field researcher banding migrant songbirds for the Black Swamp Bird Observatory before becoming the observatory's education director in 2005, then executive director in 2009, a position she holds today. Kimberly played a key role in starting the highly successful Ohio Young Birders Club, as well as the biggest week in American birding, a spring event that rapidly has become one of the largest birding festivals on the continent. She is a contributing editor to Birds in Bloom magazine and co-author of the Kaufman Field Guide to Nature of New England of 2012 and the Kaufman Field Guide to Nature of the Midwest 2015. Kimberly is vice chair of the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative and serves as the American Bird Conservancy, Conservancy Board of Directors. <laughs> So before we hear from our speakers, I'm going to share a brief intro about migration and birds themselves, because migration truly is amazing and there's so much we could talk about. So please know that this is just the tip of the iceberg. So to start, there are two main groups of birds, resident birds that stay in the same place all year and migratory ones. Migratory birds move between their breeding and non-breeding grounds as a reproductive tactic. Most migratory birds depend on insects or nectar and must follow warmer weather in order to have enough food to support themselves and their chicks. Next slide, please. So some migratory birds travel up and down mountains, making their journey only a few hundred feet. 
while some birds fly halfway around the world, like Arctic terns. Some birds have very direct paths, while some are more what we call the scenic route. And many birds end up using flyways, think of them like highways but in the sky, due to natural elements that they follow, such as coastlines, rivers, and mountain ranges. Next slide, please. So when it comes to birds, one size definitely doesn't fit all. Specifics of migration are pretty bird family or even species unique. However, in general, it can be said that larger birds tend to migrate during the day. So hawks, for example, take advantage of thermals or upward currents of hot air to help save them energy while flying. Songbirds typically migrate at night to have added protection from predators and keep cool. Songbirds also hatch knowing how, when, and where to migrate. They just know. This is compared to other birds like geese, which must uh, be taught and usually why you see them in, in large flocks. Next slide, please. There truly is so much about migration that we could talk about, days and days worth. But one of the truly magical things about it is how it brings people together. There is nothing better than the rush as you see a migratory bird for the first time each spring. For me, it truly feels like the excitement of seeing an old friend return. But an even better feeling is sharing that with others. And I feel so lucky to have done that in the field. And as you can see in these pictures, actually out with others birding, but also with you today on this webinar. Spring migration truly is the most wonderful time of the year. And so Tanya is now going to kick off the main event of this webinar and share about the Mapping Migraciones project, which is focused on connecting people and their own personal stories with bird migration. Hello, thank you so much, Jordan. And I indeed also stand with spring migration is my favorite time of year. So hello, everyone. My name is Tanya Romero. I am a program coordinator at the Audubon Center at Devs Park, located in Los Angeles, California. And I will be talking to you about our new project called Mapping Migraciones. Now, Mapping Migraciones is a non-traditional project when we talk about migration. Um, and I'll explain a little bit of why. Now, Mapping Migraciones is a year-long project that is uh, ran by Audubon California, the National Audubon Society, and Latino Outdoors. And the, the idea behind Mapping Migraciones is to be able to celebrate Latinidad migration and the stories that connect us across the Americas. Now, oftentimes, right, we as people were astonished by this concept and beauty of bird migration, and rightfully so. But oftentimes, when we're also talking about migration of people, we can feel differently. So this project is really meant to be able to connect the migration patterns of birds and people, specifically of Latin America. Now, this project has two main components. Um, if we can go to the next slide, that'd be awesome. These two components um, are an interactive map and a webinar series. With the interactive map, we use migratory bird data and stories from the general public like y'all to give us a full picture of how birds and people are connected through geography and culture. Now, for this map, we collect stories through a survey that's out to the public um, that is either within our respective websites or the Latino Outdoors websites. These stories are specific to individuals that identify as Latinx and are comfortable sharing their stories or their family's migration story to the United States or within um, the Americas. Now, all these stories are confidential. We don't ask for birthdays. We don't ask for social security numbers, anything of that sort. Um, we also have goodies for being able to share that story and those will be sent out at the end of the project. Um, we can go on to the next slide. And these are the goodies that we have. We have a limited edition tote bag that really is uh, significant of the logo and what we mean to accomplish with this project. Now, aside from this interactive map that I will be showing you a little more in depth in a little bit, um, the second component is a webinar series. And if we can go to the last slide, that'd be awesome. Now, this Webinar series gives us an opportunity to be able to learn more about not only the joy of migration, but also the complexities of the Latinidad Latin, Latin identity as it relates to not only hard science, but also environmental justice, migration, colonization, and other complex social issues. Now, this project is a combination of that hard biological sciences, right, that really encompasses that bird migra migratory data 
but also the, the social sciences when it relates to the migration stories of people. So these two subjects are often depicted as two separate things. However, this project is really meant to illustrate and be able to illustrate is interconnected through this platform of storytelling. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and I'll show you how to be able to access this project and be able to read some of the accounts that we already have. So let me go ahead and zoom this out real quick. Oh, that's the wrong slides, here we go. So um, we do have a landing page for this project. It's audubon.org, Mapping Migraciones. Um, and this is and it, the platform. Just, sorry, Tana, you're still showing the slide. Offered, okay, let me try one more time. Here we go. Here we go. Can we see the, the map now? Yes, the uh, Audubon um, website with the map, yep. Yes, great, thank you so much. All right, so this is our landing page at audubon.org, Mapping Migraciones, and this is our main platform that really showcases um, all the project. So if we go down below, we see a little blurb of like the intro of what this project is, what this project is. You have a check out the map that you can click on that will take you to that interactive map that we're talking about. Down below, you have the upcoming webinars that are coming up. Our next webinar is not set till end of June. So within a couple weeks, we should see those upcoming webinars. This is a tell us your story a link that takes you and redirects you to the survey. And lastly, down below, you have the last recording of our past webinars. So we do have three webinars that have already taken place. So when you click on that, my check out the map, you will get sent into this interactive map. And so far we have 15 submissions um, that you can all find here on this left hand column. You can click on each one of those individually. And here within the side, you'll be, you will see the information pop up. So here we have Emily Kobar's story and she talks to us a little bit about what is, what is her migration story of her family specifically coming from Guatemala? You know, why did they migrate? You know, what, what routes did they take? Um, why, was it, why was it important? And what was the transition here to, um, to Los Angeles, California? So you can read a little bit about her migration story there. And then here all the way in the bottom, she has been paired to a bird that has shared or that shares that similar route. So in this case, it's the Lee Sandpiper. So you can also learn more about the Lee Sandpiper in the same platform as well. Okay, and you can, there's multiple stories that are, that are going on. The current goal is to be able to showcase one story for each country that has proven some complexity to that considering there's so many countries in Latin America. But if you are um, interested in sharing that story, I would highly recommend you to take our survey and this is what our survey looks like. So it's a little bit of our name, email address and things like that. So like I mentioned, all of this is confidential. We don't where we don't track any of this, and um, and really you can be as in depth or as vague as you would like. So we highly encourage everyone to submit um, and be able to help us more with this project. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, and I want to go ahead and thank everyone for their time and um, for being able to share really a little bit of what what this project means to me and for the general public. Thanks so much, Tanya. So friendly reminder to the, all of the participants that you can submit your questions during the, the presentations to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Sean about the origin of Bird City and how this program has connected folks both with their local communities and with birds. Take it away, Sean. Thank you, Jordan, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking about, as, as Jordan said, about Bird City um, and its origins, but also talk to you a little bit about Bird Cities America and how ABC is going to launch this program nationally. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so Bird Cities has, has its origins in Wisconsin with Bird City, Wisconsin. The gentleman that you see here is an old friend of mine, Noel Cutright, that passed away a few years ago, but he was a leading bird conservationist in Wisconsin for decades. And, um, uh, and as he would travel throughout the state and throughout the country, 
um, he would you know, drive into a new community and, and as you see the welcome sign for a community, he would also recognize that you have those placards for the various service clubs and organizations. But he kept seeing this Tree City USA sign that would, that would show up as he drove into a community. And so he loosely modeled the concept of Bird City, Wisconsin after that Tree City initiative, thinking that if, if communities would be excited about being a, a, a tree city, wouldn't they be excited about being a community that, that supported bird conservation? So in the mid 2000s, he um, working through the Wisconsin Bird Conservation Initiative and other uh, conservation organizations shared the idea and, and created enough of an upswell of, of interest and, and energy around it that they were able to get some, some startup funding back in 2009 and about a year after that launched the program with a volunteer uh, or a halftime staff coordinator and a, and a group of volunteers that basically promoted the program. And with that, the program grew organically um, and in less than a decade, over 100 communities in Wisconsin signed up to be Bird City communities. And, uh, and today there's 111 of them. A couple of key components of that, of course, are were to get those municipalities to buy in and also engage involvement in a lot of the other community-based organizations, bird clubs, garden clubs, and other conservation organizations. Bird City Wisconsin has two levels of a general bird city program, but also oper gives opportunities for cities to really shine. And, and if they want to go above and beyond, they, get, they can become a high flyer program. Next slide. So, um, so um, the, um, there are six criteria that were established in Wisconsin uh, to, uh, to become a bird city. So you had to have elements of each one of these categories here. You had to be, uh, the city had to be engaged in, in habitat creation and protection. The community had to also have a habitat management component to this. They're actively managing for bird conservation. They had to have an element that ad addressed threats reductions, which was key in, in my mind to one of the successful elements of the program. Of course, education and outreach was important. We wanted everybody to have a climate change element. But one of the other elements that was really successful was asking every community to have a World Migratory Bird Day celebration of some sort. And this was interesting because um, Environment for the Americas, which uh, sponsors uh, mig uh, uh, Migratory uh, Bird Day, um, kept noticing year after year as they would show the map of where bird city celebrations were going that Wisconsin kept getting more and more uh, highlighted as time went on. And pretty soon Wisconsin was probably the epicenter of more bird migratory bird day celebrations than anywhere else. Next slide. So um, this interest spread, not only the interest in Wisconsin itself um, with 111 communities jumping on board, but Brian Lenz, who was the bird city coordinator, um, uh, coordinator uh, in Wisconsin um, several years ago, started getting phone calls from, from other states and other communities that were interested in what Wisconsin was doing and how they could get it started in their own program. Proud to say that, that Brian Lenz has come on board with ABC and helped with our, our collisions program. But over time, he, um, he was engaged with several communities, Colorado, Indiana, Iowa, Maryland, Minnesota, Texas, that all started their own uh, bird city com uh, communities. And then on top of that, there's several other communities that are interested in this. So it leads us to today where we're heading. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so ABC sees this as an opportunity to, to spread this program uh, throughout the Americas. So the future of Bird, Cities America, um, Bird City Americas uh, is that ABC is gonna take this on. And why are we doing this? Well, we saw the spread, this organic spread in Wisconsin and then how other states were ca capturing it. And we see it as a platform to get information out about bird conservation, threats for birds, and, and how, um, how migratory birds can play a role uh, in our communities at a grassroots level. So the spread was there, it was a popular program, it was very successful. We also can see because of our expertise and the work that Brian Lentz has done in the past that we could provide resources, advice, we can make the program creation easier for, for states and, and therefore make it easier for communities to, to sign up and we get uh, communities to sign up faster. We also can see some consistency and for efficiency and effectiveness and a meaningful branding opportunity. Next slide. So the partners. Um, so of course, ABC is actively involved uh, and we're partnering with the Environment for the Americas. And we can't forget the Fish and Wildlife Service. They have been instrumental in helping fund the program and get it launched. So um, the uh, US Fish and Wildlife Region 3 office, which is the upper Midwest Great Lakes region has funded the program along with the, uh, the Urban Bird Treaty Program. 
They recognize what we're doing with Bird Cities as a way to be a catalyst for getting communities engaged in their urban bird treaty program. We're focused in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, so uh, ABC will um, look at the overall coordination in the US and Canada, whereas the Environment for the Americas will be focusing on Latin America and the Caribbean. Next slide. So quickly, the next steps here, Bird Cities Americas, one of the things that we're going to do is put together the program so that we can provide states and communities with a successful model and branding. So we'll have all that component already pre-built. We're gonna be creating a website that, that each of the states can use and model after, as well as we'll have an online application system to make it easy for states to be able to get communities to, to apply for becoming bird cities so that they don't have to reinvent the wheel and create a, their own application process. Our staff will provide training and outgo, ongoing advice. We'll be looking at inter-program coordination and connections. How can we see programs that are working in some states and, and share those, uh, those programs with other states or other communities? We'll also be raising some money so that we can provide some grants for communities and we can expand some regional program ideas. Uh, and then last but not least, we'll look for some other initiatives such as tour tourism initiatives, sister city activities, and, and other things as well. Next slide. So um, um, again, we're modeling this after Bird City. So this program will have the same six criteria that every city will have to have. They'll have to have a, a um, bird pro habitat protection program of some sort in place. They'll also have their community actively engaged in, in, in supporting that habitat for, for migratory birds. Again, we want to be able to address those threats, whether it's cats um, outdoors, uh, collisions, uh, pesticides, what have you. Of course, an education and outreach uh, component. Climate change will also be uh, an element. And then that World Migratory Bird Day component, which was so strong with the Bird, Bird City Wisconsin program. Next slide. So this is our last slide. The immediate next steps that we've got going on, we're pleased to say that a few weeks ago, we, were hired, we hired Joanna Eccles to take over the program. She's our new, uh, she's our new coordinator for Bird Cities America. Um, uh, and uh, she will be instrumental in building that website that I talked about. And that website is key to helping states and communities um, hit the ground running. We'll be working with the existing programs that are out there, the states that already have bird city programs and, and onboarding them into the new, the new program. And then those, those handful of communities that are already in conversations about starting up a bird city um, a statewide program, we'll be helping them get on board um, as well. And then we'll be working with um, our own internal experts here at ABC, as well as other experts around the country uh, to uh, expand other resources that can be then shared across, across the country and into Latin America and the Caribbean. And uh, last but not least, we hope to be able to launch the website and the official program here in late 2021 or early 2022. And next slide, and that should be it. Thank you, Jordan, so much. Thank you, Sean. So friendly reminder to everyone that we are recording this webinar and we'll be sure to get you links and more information afterwards via an email. And again, we encourage you to answer, uh, use the Q&A box to uh, submit all of your questions that we will then answer at the end. Uh, so please uh, just jump right in with those. But right now we're gonna hear from Kimberly about how birds have made Northwest Ohio a destination hotspot and literally created the biggest week in American birding. Thank you so much, Jordan. I'm so excited to be part of ABC's webinar series and incredibly honored to present with Tanya and Sean. And I'm gonna first put my American Bird Conservancy cap on and just thank all the participants for your interest in birds and migration and for your support for American Bird Conservancy. I've been working in bird conservation for more than 30 years. And I can tell you with great confidence that ABC is the most effective bird conservation organization in this country. So your interest and support is well spent. So thank you so much. Um, but for the purpose of today, I'm gonna to talk about another nonprofit that's near and dear to my heart, Black Swamp Bird Observatory. Uh, next slide, please. So the Bird Observatory is named and we're located in the remnants of the historic Great Black Swamp. And this was an area of vast wetlands that covered more than 1,500 miles. Now, sadly, about 90% of these wetlands have been drained, but the remaining 10% are still offer a vast amount of habitat for migratory birds. Next slide. 
so there are there are a great diversity of birds that utilize these areas, but in particular, it's a really wonderful place to connect with warblers, the, the feathered eye candy that are so popular among birders. And I'd like to talk just briefly about why there are such concentrations of birds in Northwest Ohio. So next slide. So Jordan touched on migration and her introductory remarks. So I'm not gonna to talk too much about that. We know that migratory songbirds are making north and south journeys um, from the wintering grounds to the breeding grounds. Next slide. And I just wanted to, to um, speak briefly about something that Jordan touched on about the fact that isn't it absolutely mind blowing, like astonishing that these tiny migratory birds are migrating at night, that the adults don't show them the way that that, that route is hardwired. I just, I just find that so very inspiring. So I, I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, but there are some other factors that bring the large numbers of birds to Northwest Ohio. So next slide. So the next factor for us is Lake Erie. Um, we are right on the shores, the, the southern shore of Lake Erie in Northwest Ohio. And if you are a tiny migratory songbird that weighs less than an ounce and you don't swim and you don't even float, you are very reluctant to cross a large body of water unless you are at your energetic best. So as these birds are coming in overnight and seeing this large body of water, that's a daunting barrier for migratory birds. And they wanna put down in those forested and coastal wetlands right on the shore of Lake Erie to rest and refuel before they make this large uh, crossing across this large body of water. Next slide. And speaking of food, um, nature provides, and the timing of this is just so intricate and so, uh, so wonderful. Uh, next slide. So coinciding with the arrival of spring um, songbirds in the region is the hatch of this aquatic insect called a midge. These are tiny little insects. They look like they could be pesky, but they don't even have mouth parts, so they can't bite. But this massive emergence of these little aquatic insects happens just as songbirds are passing through the area. And this insect hatch creates a bonanza of food for migratory birds. And what's great for birders is that these insects tend to stay low in the vegetation. So it brings these feasting songbirds like warblers down at eye level in our area and just makes for really spectacular connections with these little migratory birds. Next slide. And finally, we have what we call the funneling effect here. Next slide. <laughs> If you look at the three general routes that migratory songbirds take in spring, they follow three general routes. So you have the eastern migrants that come up through the Greater and Lesser Antilles, cross Cuba, and hit the, the eastern seaboard. The second group, this is a really cool group of, of little migratory songbirds. This group, this is the, tran, the trans-gulf migrants. Uh, they're going to leap off the Yucatan Peninsula and power right across the Gulf of Mexico. It's something like an 18-hour journey. Just imagine weighing less than an ounce and making that crossing. It's just astonishing. And then we have a third group that's maybe a little smarter. <laughs> they're going to skirt the Gulf of Mexico and come up through the Great Plains. But look what happens right across Northwest Ohio. All three of those general routes converge right across those coastal marshes and those forested edges in Northwest Ohio, bringing tremendous numbers of migratory songbirds, but also spectacular diversity. Next slide. And when you combine that with the fact that we have a lot of access for the public, we can immerse people in spring songbird migration in a way that I don't think anyone else in the world really can. You've got boardwalks that protect the habitat um, and trails that are accessible. It's free to the public. And then you've got birds that are down low in the vegetation feasting on those insects. So it just all combines, all the birding stars align to create a really For decades, no one was marketing this spectacular birding experience to the global birding audience. So 
Black Swamp Bird Observatory moved into an area on the McGee Marsh Wildlife Area, uh, one of the most iconic birding destinations for spring migration, um, and saw this opportunity to market the area and a need to market it to build support for habitat conservation. So next slide. So the Bird Observatory leadership put together a conservation business plan with the end goal being creating a birding festival. We spent three years reaching out to people across the region to get the region ready to provide services. It's a great area for tourism, but just to make sure that they understood what the birding audience would want so that they were ready to welcome people um, with valuable services. And in just four years, the biggest week became the biggest birding festival on the continent. So next slide. So just on paper, the biggest week is an annual 10 day birding festival. Yes, 10 days <laughs> um, held in May. It's time to coincide with the peak of spring songbird migration in the area. And the event now helps to bring more than 90,000 people, that's not a typo, 90,000 people to the area from all over the world. So that's kind of the stats of the biggest week, but I don't wanna to fail to mention what's at the heart of it. That's the engine, here's the heart. So next slide. The Biggest Week connects people with migratory birds in such a powerful and magical way that it becomes this incredible gathering of happy souls. All of us united from different walks of life, different races, uh, different backgrounds, all coming together just to share our common love of birds and bird migration. And we send these people back out into the world after this joyful experience armed with a lot of knowledge and a lot of desire and passion to do more in their area to help migratory birds. And then we do our part. So next slide. When we were building the biggest week in American birding, we knew that we needed to collect economic impact and travel data. It wouldn't be enough for us simply to say to our elected officials, there are a lot of birders coming and they're spending a lot of money. We needed data. So after the biggest week in American birding wraps up, we send out an electronic economic impact and travel survey to get that data. And the data shows that conservatively, the, the biggest week in American birding on an annual basis generates more than $40 million. It's become an economic engine that's extended the tourism season in our region by a full six weeks. So armed with that important data, next slide, We stepped way, way out of our comfort zone um, where we're, we love to talk with birders, to talk with business owners, chambers of commerce, rotary clubs, offices of economic development, and then elected officials on every level, local, regional, state, and federal elected officials. And we didn't just talk, we brought all of these people out birding as well so that they could see how many people from all over the world were right here in their backyard enjoying natural areas and spending money um, in our local area. Next slide. So what does this all mean for bird conservation? Well, through all those meetings and all those partnerships that we've built, we have worked hard to beat the drum for the message that this economy, this economic impact of $40 million um, in the region is fundamentally linked to habitat conservation. If we are not good stewards of this habitat and we don't work together to continue to protect and conserve and expand habitat in our region, um, then all of that is in jeopardy. That could all go away. And it's wonderful to see the entire region embracing the biggest week and bird migration and working together. So what does that look like in action. Next slide. During migration, collisions with tall lighted building, buildings are one of the leading causes of songbird migration, of songbird mortality. But it can be very difficult and challenging to get building owners and managers simply to turn off certain kinds of lights during a spring and fall migration. 
it shouldn't be that difficult, but it is. But in the city of Toledo, our nearest big population base, when as soon as we reached out, all of the leadership in Toledo now armed with the knowledge, they were informed about the impact that birding has on our region. They care about birds. We put the information out there and city officials immediately took action. So that is what the skyline of the city of Toledo looks like right now during spring and fall migration. We send out reminders, but sometimes they'll email us to say, Kimberly, is it time for us? When, when, when are the dates that we turn those lights off again? They're on it. They know and they're ready. So that is how all of this can come together. Birders coming here just to enjoy birds, having an economic impact and our organization leveraging that to do more for bird conservation. So that is a very quick romp through just one element of what we're doing at Black Swamp Bird Observatory to connect people with birds in a joyful way and leverage that for bird conservation. So last slide, just because it's a beautiful picture of a black-throated blue. <laughs> Thank you all so much. I really appreciate your time and attention. Thank you so much, Kimberly. I personally can't wait to get back back to that boardwalk. We can't um, wait so talk. this <laughs> so this concludes our presentations, and we'll move now into the Q and A portion. On the screen right now is just the ABC website and a way to contact us, and we'll make sure that you have this again. But if I can ask the presenters to please turn on their cameras for the questions, we'll get through as many as we can friendly reminder that this is being recorded. And so if we don't get to your questions, again, a lot of information is on the ABC website and we'll make sure that you have ways to get those questions answered. We're gonna start with a few questions that came in during the webinar registration, and then we'll take some of the questions that came in live during the presentations. So to start off, I'm gonna ask Tanya, if you can share more about uh, children and how to connect children's stories and, and the work that you're doing with bird migration? Yeah, I think that's always a good question and I'm gonna be a little biased. Um, I think Audubon centers are a great place to start um, just because we cater specifically to uh, educational programs, specifically to family oriented audiences. Um, and most of our Audubon centers offer, you know, the, the family oriented bird walk. So it's not necessarily all the time about, oh, let's tally the birds as fast as we can. It's really being able to offer that introductory courses or uh, walks that can really engage um, a wider right of audiences in different age groups. And most of these centers also um, provide the materials. So most of these, specifically in LA, at our site, we do rent out binoculars for free to the general public. And I know other centers around the nation do that as well. So I think that's a very um, great place to start to really be able to engage um, some of our children. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Kimberly, I also was hoping that you could answer a follow-up question, specifically talking about teens and tweens and how to get them interested in birding, especially given early spring migration hours. Well, um, about 15 years ago, the Bird Observatory was interested in starting a group for preteen and teenage birders. And rather than uh, duplicate efforts, I cast around the United States to try to find what other programs were out there and got the, oh no, we don't want to talk with teenagers. Because <laughs> um, teenagers can be challenging. But um, what we did was, and I would encourage everyone to, to, um, to listen to this, that we put kids in charge. So we reached out to six teenagers across the state of Ohio and brought them together to say, what do you want? What would you want in a program so that it was tailored to what they were interested in? And from that, we uh, developed something called the Ohio Young Birders Club. And I think any time that you just simply listen to what teenagers want, now keep in mind that one of the first things they wanted was a trip to Costa Rica. <laughs> so you can't always deliver. Um, but just facilitating um, anything that's really possible. And we've used the Ohio Young Birders Club as a model. If you go to um, the Young Birders Club website, we have a, a, um, a dedicated website for that program. There's a template that you can download that takes you step by step how to follow the model that we've created. But I think the, the success of it over all these years and hundreds of students is that we just simply listened to what they wanted in a program rather than trying to figure it out as old people. <laughs> Thank
Thanks. So Sean, maybe quickly in your answer, you can give a brief summary, but this question says that given the news of the 3 billion bird decline, how are you, I'm gonna ask all of the panelists then, uh, but how are you staying optimistic when migratory birds are in such precipitous decline? Well, um, again, it is difficult time, at times to stay optimistic, but um, I look at the great work of uh, my colleagues at ABC and our other bird conservation organizations, such as Kimberly's, Tanya's, um, we're, we're doing great work out there. So um, at ABC, for example, in the Great Lakes region where, that I oversee, I mean, we've got a, a dozen foresters and conservationists out there helping create habitat for, for birds that are steep to climb, whether that's Kirtland warbler or golden wing warbler. So I, I think there's, a, I think first of all, three billion birds has drawn attention to the fact that we, we are seeing this steep decline. And, and, and I think there's a lot of energy uh, amongst organizations to do something about it. Um, so I think that's the first thing. So just before Tanya and Kimberly jump in, uh, for the audience, there was a massive uh, publicized paper uh, commonly known as the Three Billion Birds paper that was based on peer-reviewed science that reported three billion birds of the total North American population have been lost since 1970. So just to give a little bit more context, we ha we have this really important urgent need to, to do bird conservation work. And I think that's what the, the person asking was, was talking about. But Tanya and Kimberly, Tanya, do you wanna go with how you stay motivated? Yeah, I, that's a very loaded question <laughs> because it, it's very distraught news, right? And I think for me specifically, right, um, I have this clear passion for birds. I have this clear love for them, right, as an individual here, right, an inhabitant of the planet. And I think I always concentrate on like, what can I focus on that is manageable for my being? And um, with that said, right, it's very distraughtful news for me because I know that I'm also a part of that issue as just uh, a human being really, right? That has the privilege of living really in a, in a very comfortable home, in a very uh, comfortable situation, right? Um, so I think for me, it's, it's going back and rethinking a lot about what can I do in my everyday life to lim limit my consumption, to limit right, my lifestyles, right, like, do I really need that extra pair of clothes, do I really need, right, um, that extra water bottle, you know, can I go to reusable options, you know, and what does that look like, and I think that motivates me at the fact that that's a huge push that I think a lot of humans are realizing now, that a lot of us are taking ownership and accountability, that we are part of the issue, but we can also be part of the problem, so I think for me that that brings a lot of hope on that. Thank you, Tanya. Kimberly, do you want to just with a sentence or two share? Well, I think um, I'm, I'm always encouraged by the fact that nature is more resilient than we give it credit for. But also most recently, um, I guess I would say one of the positive outcomes, if you can say such a thing about the pandemic, is that during the lockdowns, thousands and thousands of people connected with birds and discover the joyfulness of birds right in their own backyard. We have a new engaged audience to work with. If we can bring them along on their journey in a gentle way to help them understand that they have a role to play as individuals in habitat conservation. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, apologies for bopping around with the different questions, but I definitely am gonna try and get through as many as I can. So Sean, I'm gonna come back to you. A lot of folks are hoping to have a little bit more direction on what they can do uh, as individuals to help move a bird city program in their own community. Should they oh. be talking to the mayor? Is there, I, I know you said the website's coming and we will be sure to publicize that when it's launched, but what can people do now to get ready to help? Yes, so first of all, that list of states that I told you that already have programs in place, um, um, you should, each one of those has their own statewide website right now with criteria in terms of how to get involved. So what I would say is, is get the information on, on what the criteria is to become a bird city within your state, and then talk to your local community leaders, whether that's an, an alderman or a mayor 
um, as well as the strongest bird city programs that we have. Um, yes, the city has to be engaged, but they're often pushed by local establishments such as Audubon clubs or bird club or the chamber, West Bend, Wisconsin was the chamber of commerce was the one that got on board and said, we want to be a bird city and then engaged the bird city community and, or the, the, the Audubon society and the other ones. So, so find out what your rules are, um, go to the elected officials and or the, the organizations within the community and start building um, enthusiasm uh, within your community about uh, what it would take to, to become a bird city. Thanks, Sean. So Tanya, over to you. Sorry, I'm hearing a bit of an echo. Um, so Tanya, can you talk about if participants who share their migration stories get to stay in touch or do any networking or is there anything that gets uh, ha that happens after those those stories get published with those individuals? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, as of now, there is no platform setting in place, to be quite honest. Um, a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's a new, a new project, and realistically, this is a pilot year. Um, we didn't, we, I was hopeful we would, it would receive really great feedback. I did not think I was going to receive the amount of support I've been receiving. Um, with that said, I know that we're taking considerations of, of what this may look like long term, and I think that can definitely be a possibility. But as of now, um, I'm doing a lot of that underground work. So if you want to be connected to a local Audubon center or network, I can definitely do that. Thanks, Tanya. So then Kimberly, over to you. Um, and I know that you'll be the perfect person to answer this because... <laughs> The person asking this question says, being blind and knowing many birders, uh, what programs are offered to help those with disabilities like blind birders to actively participate in community events? Um, so another person actually answered a similar question and asked about mobility uh, concerns about birding. Um, and so I know that you have a perfect response for this. I do. Thank you for put, tossing this one my way. Um, I recently joined the board of an organization called Bird Ability, and I encourage all of you to check out their website. It's a brand new nonprofit, but the mission is incredibly important. And Bird Ability's mission is to make birding safe and accessible for people with all kinds of disabilities. So um, check out the website. They have a map of birding areas across the country that they're continuing to add to that um, gives information about how accessible these birding areas really are. And they're bringing levels of information to the birding community. They're just getting started, but it, it's just so incredible to see what's happening already. I'll, I'll give everyone just two quick examples, if that's okay, Jordan. Yeah, um, absolutely. A simple thing like when you're using social media, if people are using readers to help enjoy, if they, if they have vision problems and they, they're using a reader, if you capitalize the first word, if you're using hashtags, capitalize the first word of each word in your hashtag, the readers can read that then. If you have a photograph, give a brief or a detailed description of what that photo is. So the reader tells the user what the image is tied to the post. It can be that simple, um, just to make it a more rich experience for everyone. So again, just check out the BirdAbility website. You'll find them on Google and they're bringing so much to the birding experience to you know, make things more inclusive and more accessible. Thanks, Kimberly. Thank you. So another one that Kimberly and then Sean, you can jump in too is, um, uh, I'm summarizing a few questions here and it says basically one of the things that, that we all know, which is birds don't observe political boundaries. And so what work is happening in the Great Lakes specifically, given Biggest Week and then Sean's position uh, with Canada, um, whether that's with Peely Island across the lake or of Lake Erie or Ontario. Um, and I don't want, I don't know if either of you want to jump in with, with that. Go ahead, Sean. Well, also a um, couple things that, that we're doing uh, in Ontario in particular. Um, um, so, um, I'm involved with the Kirtland's Warbler Conservation Team. And uh, um, Kirtland's, um, uh, we're working on expanding the core range. So 
So Kirtland's their core range is in that um, central re northern region of, of the lower peninsula of Michigan. But we want to expand that range. So the UP of Michigan, Wisconsin, and Ontario are the three other places that we're hoping to expand. So, so we're working with a group of partners right now and looking at areas that, that, that we can hopefully protect some land, but also work on habitat management for, for Kirtland's warbler. But in addition to that, um, ABC is partnering with another organization called the Boreal Avian Modeling Network and the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. And we're looking at cross-border opportunities uh, between Canada and the US where, where we can do some large scale um, um, management practices that would be better for birds. So these, these large uh, industrial um, um, timber companies that are harvesting wood they are already, already doing it sustainably, but how can we work with them to, to do better practices that would help with uh, migratory birds um, in the future? The Boreal Avian Modeling Network um, has this vast database, so they know where the birds are, are, are gathering, where they're flying to, where they're breeding. So we're trying to bring all, these wonderful, all this wonderful information together, the, the expertise of, of foresters at ABC, the industry leaders who are, are practicing um, um, sustainable practices, and then the knowledge base from the, the Avian Modeling Network to all come together and hopefully do a better job. Did you want me to add something, Jordan? Only if you want. Yeah, just I'll, I'll mention briefly that um, the Black Swamp Bird Observatory is known for the biggest week in American birding, but we do migratory bird research. We have a banding station that's the largest banding station, migration station in the country. And we're working collaboratively with a lot of other banders in Canada because, you know, a lot of these migrating birds that come to Northwest Ohio power right on across the lake and they're breeding in Canada. So to make sure that we understand what our population trends are showing from our migration research, our banding research, and how that, um, how that connects to what they're finding at the stations across the lake in Canada. So there's a lot of research collaboration going on as well. A lot of cross pollination, if you will. <laughs> Thank you. Another question that we got is actually from someone who is a lights out coordinator and would like to know other than the actual data of uh, from collisions uh, of bird collisions at buildings, do either, uh, or Tanya, please feel free to jump in too, um, but does anyone have additional really good uh, helps get, sorry, I'm just trying to like summarize this question, uh, try, trying to get building owners to turn off their lights and do other things that are, that would be related to bird cities. So does anyone have any really good, basically convincing arguments other than the, the bird data directly that you use to get those folks involved? Well, I'll, I'll just speak really quickly, Jordan, that um, the data on how many new birders are out there, um, there, there aren't a lot because lights have become much more energy efficient. That's not a good motivator. It's not a good incentive anymore. Um, but PR, every company wants good PR and they want to avoid bad press. So going in now armed with the fact that now we have thousands of more birders out there who care about birds and who are watching and who are informed about the fact that your building could be causing these collisions. Um, if you come on board, think about the powerful positive press that will come um, by doing something really, really simple and easy by turning off these decorative lights during spring and fall migration. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, from our standpoint, um, um, you know, the cost of Designing and building a building with bird-friendly glass right up front is no more expensive than than if you didn't do it. I mean, the, the bird-friendly glass is, is has come down in, in price drastically. So, for example, the the Bucks Arena in Milwaukee. Uh, when we first started having conversations with them about making their their building bird-friendly, there was they were worried about the cost of of, uh, of what it was what would it take. And when they found out that the cost was negligible, it, it was it was a no-brainer. And then we worked with Northwestern University down in Chicago, and and they had just built a large glass building and had to retrofit it, which is costing them a, a large uh, fortune, basically, to do that. And so they learned their lesson. And when they designed their next building, they they put in bird-friendly elements right from the start. So I think if we educate architects, engineers, that that they can do things that are simple corrections, uh, and and if you're after a LEED certification, there's a LEED credit for doing it. 
So, so they can be smart. They can they can you know be cost effective right from the start. And that building collisions is one of the threats that bird cities would address. Correct, Sean? Absolutely. We got a, Absolutely. Exactly. We got a question about if you could talk about just some of the other threats, both what are the threats and then what what can cities do? So I don't know yes. if you can briefly. Yes. So yes. Yeah. So so collisions are, are important. And I, again, as I'm somebody who actually volunteered to help a few community uh, com communities become bird cities. And so so we did several things. Um, um, so for bird collisions, um, it, 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 um, we're promoting um, ordinances so that commercial buildings need to be bird friendly right from the start. We're making, we're getting some traction there. We're actually getting some traction and getting some communities to do that. Uh, in addition to that, educating homeowners. Um, there's a lot of window collisions in, in homes. The window collisions ha happen in the first four or five stories of, of a building. So. So land uh, homeowners need to know that that they can do things too. So so most municipalities that I helped out, we provided information on on, on the website. In one community, we, we offered an incentive to actually uh, cost share on on the decals that you could put on windows to help with with bird collisions. Cats outdoors is another one. Um, um, as a matter of fact, if you want to be a high flyer program in Wisconsin, you can't have a trap neuter release program in your state, or you can't encourage a cat colonies. So, so you can't be a high flyer if you're if you're not going to have good programs. And then, of course, promoting uh, cat licensing and keeping cats indoors is important. Um, encouraging people to use less pesticides around their homes. Um, um, and you know, um, um, I'm just trying to think of a couple other things that we that we put into place. Um, um, so uh, again, collisions is a big one in Port Washington, um, which is a community on the lake. Um, we've provided educational programs about wind generation towers and the, and the importance of making sure that if the community ever does um, permit um, towers, that they permit them in such a place that they they actually do good um, transparent research before they consider where and when they would put a tower up. So. Wonderful. Thanks, Sean. Tanya, I'm going to come over to you and say if there was one thing that you were going to share uh, in terms of reassuring someone that wanted to participate or wasn't sure, um, or if they, if someone had a favorite bird that they wanted to get paired with, uh, do you have anything that you would really want people to know and take away from this webinar about your project? Um, so all of that is possible when you fill out the survey. You can input a favorite bird or a bird you connect with. I think specifically of a takeaway of this project is um, just how expansive like the bird community is and this knowledge of birds is I think for me you know the reason why I'm so invested in this project is because I mean I'm a huge birder and I'm the solid like science birder as well like bird banding molt like you know point count surveys and I love the field aspect of it but my solidification into this was me finding out that my grandma in Mexico also had a huge passion for birds and I didn't grow up with her, you know? And to me, that was always amazing and astonished to hear because I was like, man, some of this maybe, you know, gets passed on like this passion or this love or this connectedness, right? And I think I try to bring that also into a lot of, a lot of the work I do and being able to look far beyond those those traditional approaches that I think often the birding community is locked into. So I think for me, that is a, a product really of this project, being able to unconventionally think, right, of, of, of some of the, the, the bird knowledge. Like, so you're still learning that hard science through this project, just not in a scientific way of a webinar or you know collecting the data, like you're learning it through a storytelling platform. And to me, there's a lot of beauty in that into being able to connect to our communities. That's wonderful. Thank you, Tanya. Unfortunately, we're almost at the top of the hour. So I'm just gonna ask two more questions quickly and I'll just give the panelists a, a second to think about them. So the first question is, do you have a favorite migration fact or a burning migration question? Maybe there's a big scientific question that, about migration that you just can't stop thinking about. And then the second question is going to be, what can you, or what is your biggest tip 
to help migratory birds. So just think about it for a second. And we'll start with Tanya. And we'll start with the question of that favorite fact or like biggest migration question. Uh, yeah, I think for me is do vagrants do things intentionally? So, you know, is it really, mm -hmm. are they dyslexic and just decide to pay the Western flyway, Pacific flyway, you know, a visit? Or are they like, I'm tired of the Atlantic flyway, let me go hang out on the Pacific side. So I think that's my <laughs> That's a great one. Sean, do you want to go next? Well, my, my question is very much related to that. It, you know, I, I'm just amazed at, at the information we're getting about the migratory paths that, that birds take. Uh, and we're in a <laughs> renaissance of scientific knowledge because of uh, tracking uh, data that we're getting. So I just want to, I just gobble that information up and want to know more and more about the paths that birds are taking and the wonderful journeys that they take. And, and again, like Tanya is saying, sometimes it doesn't seem like there's any rhyme or reason to why, where they're going, but hopefully someday we'll figure it out and we can protect the stopover sites as much as the as much as the uh, breeding grounds, right? And Kimberly, well, I still as 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 much as we know about migratory birds, the questions that are still out there are are so exciting. Um, there's so much for young people still to discover, but I think my favorite fact is something like the bar-tailed godwit making this astounding long distance migration from like Alaska to New Zealand and like absorbing some of its in, inner, its organs to power its flight and then regrowing those organs when it arrives. This 18,000 mile or something like that nonstop flight. It's just, if birds can do that, we can do anything. <laughs> we can do anything it takes to protect migratory birds or something like a little black pole warbler that weighs like 16 grams flying 80 hours over the ocean to get to the tip of Brazil. I mean, come on, our part is simple. We just have to do, be good stewards of the land and the birds will continue to amaze us and inspire us and motivate us. I totally agree. And that's a great <laughs> segue into the last question of this webinar, which is what is your top tip to help migratory birds? And we'll go in the same order. So Tanya, Sean, then Kimberly. I will say, Kimberly, you just gave me chills because oh. it's true. Like whenever I read facts like that, I'm like, oh, you know. Um, I think for me, I always tell folks, stay curious and, and, and stay proactive. Like, mm -hmm. I think specifically in science, we're so hooked into the art, we, what we already know. And we have to think science is revolving. You know, different things come up all the time and we have to adapt and shift. So stay curious and, and stay proactive. Love that. Stay curious. Yeah. Um, I, I can't come up with just one. So I'm going to cheat and have three quick ones. One is plant native plants. Two is to address the threats at your own homes uh, for birds, whether that's cats, collisions, or whatever, or pesticides. And three, support your bird conservation organizations, ABC, Black Swamp Observatory, uh, your local land trust. Um, that's so important. Well, Sean took mine <laughs> because I was going to say it, it can be as simple as just giving your support to American Bird Conservancy because I'll tell you, I've worked with the staff, I've worked with the board, and these people just get it done for birds. It's just amazing to me what ABC accomplishes as they come off as this giant organization, but they're still so nimble um, and so able to just jump in and address a threat. I'm just, I just love this organization, but um, I, I would say there are obvious things, keep your cats indoors, some of the things we talked about, but maybe one of the more fun and easy things to do is take someone new birding, share this gift of awareness and the joyfulness of birds. It's like the greatest gift I will ever give anyone and then help them along on their journey to understand you have a role as an individual to protect these birds that bring us all together and unite us in this, this joyful thing that we love. So. I can't thank all of our speakers enough and I can't thank the panelists, uh, the participants enough either. Um, just thank you all for attending today. Thank you for all of the wonderful questions that sparked incredible answers. Um, and so with that, I'm going to end the webinar, but again, it was recorded and we'll be in touch for sure. I hope you all see some migratory birds soon. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you.